So, welcome to Flexible Furlough. I'm Jill Coote. I'll be taking you through this session. Regrettably, I've just had a message while Maxine was speaking that Nick is unable to get on this afternoon, regrettably, but I will be on hand to Q&A and also leave all his contact details for you to contact him also after the event today or through Maxine. So he sends his sincere apologies. So just a quick introduction where Krona is concerned. You may have heard of Krona before, you may have not. We are the UK's longest running employment law and health and safety uh, business in the UK. We cover any size business from one very small business, one part-time member of staff, up to like multinationals and any size in between. As you can see, we have a high number of clients in all different sectors because getting it right first time, the decisions you make, the discussions you have, and the situations you're involved in. I often see where employers are concerned the decisions they make are morally, morally right, but procedurally wrong. And this is where it really can work against you in a tribunal system. We look after a huge amount of trade and member associations. We are currently receiving more than 2,500 advice line calls a day. And on those advice lines or on your board with us as a full member, all the information we give you is documented, logged, and it also indemnified. And we can represent you in tribunal as we have our own solicitors and barristers in-house, which has come as part of that indemnity. So if you are concerned, you have something on the horizon in this regard, then please do give us a call and we can have a chat with you on a one-to-one -one basis. What we're going to cover today is the job retention scheme, what flexible furlough is, who it applies to, the lengths of flexible fur furlough, cut my teeth in, the pay element, paying staff on flexible furlough, the government contributions to the scheme, keeping records, working during flexible furlough, calculating the working hours, holiday and furlough, which is something that happened two days ago, and the furlough navigator. So, we know what the job retention scheme, it was um, introduced because furlough in its original format means no work, no pay. So the job retention scheme overridden the no pay element to make sure that you could claim back 80% of their wages salary as long as the employees met the criteria. This is something completely separate to a layoff policy or a shortage of work policy. Flexible furlough, this is now in and it's been put in so as a business you're able to bring staff back on a part-time basis because whilst some businesses have been absolutely running at full capacity other businesses had to follow up follow all their staff starting to bring them back on a part-time basis and that can be for many reasons it could be you have problems with your suppliers or the social distancing and density and all the things in between but previously when you placed your staff on furlough they have not been able to do any work for your company or, or an associated organisation if as a business you wanted to claim 80% of their wages from the government. But flexible furlough now replaces this saying that you can now bring people back to work part time and the companies can still claim the grant. It's not to say you've got to bring all your staff back part time, you can still furlough your staff as well full time. Okay, So flexible furlough means that as an employer you'll still be able to claim the furlough grant for the hours they flexibly furloughed employees do not work compared to the hours they would normally work, have worked in that period. So who the scheme applies to? So from the 1st of July this week, only employees that their employer had previously successfully claimed a previous grant for will be eligible for more grants under the scheme. So what that actually means is you must have previously furloughed for at least three consecutive weeks taking place any time between March and the 30th of June 2020. And the minimum three consecutive week period must have been completed by the 30th of June, which is why the last day you could have fellow an employee for the first time was the 10th of June. But there are exceptions to this. This doesn't include staff who are returning from maternity, paternity, adoption, shared parental, or parental bereavement leave. You can still place these employees on furlough even if they haven't been furloughed before. Now 
we when you furloughed staff you should have entered into a furlough agreement with them saying that you've placed them on furlough whether you're paying the 80 percent or you're updating the extra 20 percent to 100 percent of pay that was up to you but also they would agree they would do any work for you as an employer and any associated business so when you're placing your employees on flexible furlough you are going to have to enter a new agreement with them because they will need to agree to the arrangements for their part-time work and these agreements must be kept for five years and also your furlough agreements because HMRC are going to be doing checks on companies to make sure you have the right documentation so you are able to make those claims and to make sure there were no fraudulent claims. You don't need to place all your employees on furlough and in addition you can continue to fully furlough employees if you wished. So it means that furloughed employees do not have to be brought back part-time it gives you the flexibility as the employer. The length of flexible furlough changes because flexible furlough agreements can last any amount of time, which means you don't have to flexibly furlough them for a minimum of three weeks. But the period that employees claim for must be for a minimum period of seven calendar days. And employees can enter into a flexible furlough agreement more than once with you. Now where the pay element is concerned, currently employers need to pay furloughed employees at least 80% of their usual monthly earnings up to a maximum of 2,500. The government then reimbursed employers through the scheme, including providing employer contributions, national insurance and pension. Employers claim for a minimum of three weeks and were able to choose to pay employees more than the grant, but they didn't have to. Employees still pay the income tax, national insurance contributions, and any other deductions from wages, but this is changing going forward. From the 1st of July, employees will pay the employee for the hours they work, along with the national insurance contribution and pension contributions for those hours. The scheme will allow employers to recover the remainder of wages up to a maximum cap. The wage cap are proportional to the hours an employee is furloughed. An example being an employee is entitled to 60% of the 2,500 cap if they are placed on furlough for 60% of their usual hours. Claims under the flexible furlough scheme will open on the 1st of July. When claiming for employees who are flexibly furloughed, you should not claim until they're sure of the exact number of hours they would have worked during the claim period. So it means that employers should claim when they've certainty about the number of hours their employees are working during the claim period. If, as an employer, you claim in advance and the employee works for more hours than, they've, than you've told HMRC about, you'll have to pay some of the grant back to HMRC. From the 1st of August, Employers will need to start paying pension and natural insurance contributions for the time furloughed staff are not working. So again, this changes. From the 1st of September, it changes again. Employers will need to start contributing 10% of the 80% grant given to furloughed workers. It changes again on the 1st of October, Well, employers will need to start contributing 20%. And the scheme will close in its entirety at the end of October. And regrettably, this is why we're starting to see a big rise in being reported of redundancies taking place. Now, with the national living wage and national minimum wage is concerned, payment on furlough does not have to meet the national minimum wage or national living wage because these rates are already payable for hours worked. But furloughed workers who return part time will need to be paid at the usual rate by their employer, which must not dip below the national minimum wage or national living wage. So again, you need to refer to their contract terms on pay. But keeping records is key. And as an employer, you'll need to keep records of how many hours your employees work and the number of hours they're furloughed during flexible furlough. An example is, employers will need to record that an employee who normally works for 30, 37 hours a week is actually working for 15 hours and is furloughed for 22 hours. So what are the rules about working during flexible furlough? 
During flexible furlough, employees are not allowed to do any work for employers or any linked or associate, associated organisation during the period that they are recorded as being on furlough. Okay, so employees on flexible furlough can do training during the hours that they are recorded as being on furlough, but must be paid at least a national minimum wage for those hours on training. So another look at calculating working hours. If an employee is flexibly furloughed, employers need to work out the employee's usual hours and record the actual hours they work as well as their furloughed hours for each claim period. There are two different calculations that can be used to work out the employee's usual hours, depending on whether they work fixed hours or variable hours. Employers should work out work Employees should work out usual hours for employees who work variable hours if either their employee is not contracted to a fixed number of hours or their employee's pay depends on the number of hours they work. So whether the employee's working hours are fixed or their pay doesn't vary with the amount of hours worked, the reference period for calculating their usual hours is the hours they contracted for at the end of the last pay period ending on or before the 19th of March 2020. Where an employee works variable hours, employers will use the higher of the average number of hours worked in the tax year 2019 to 2020 or the corresponding calendar period in the tax year 2019 to 2020. So that's whichever is the higher when you look at those two. Now looking at maternity con considerations. So if you have employees on maternity leave, they could be furloughed provided they were receiving at least 80% pay during leave. Those receiving statutory maternity pay could not be furloughed due to not being re in receipt of 80% pay. And statutory maternity pay is recoverable through existing means in any case. The 10th of June cutoff date does not apply to those on maternity, paternity, adoption, shared parental and parental bereavement leave. They can be furloughed for the first time on their return provided the employers has previously furloughed other employees. If employees about to go on maternity leave have seen their earnings reduced due to a period on furlough or statutory sick pay prior to the maternity leave starting, their normal pay should be used to calculate statutory maternity pay. The same principle applies to contractual adoption pay, paternity pay and shared parental pay. That's to make sure they do meet the threshold. Now, where education, early years, children, social care sectors are concerned, extra conditions be put in place which may restrict employers in these sectors from using the scheme whether it be full furlough or flexible furlough. As the government expects all relevant organisations to consider options to reduce operating costs and secure commercial loans before utilising the scheme. No educational settings that are in receipt of some public funding should only furlough employees in certain circumstances. And there has been separate legislation on this. If this does affect you today, please do make contact with us. So making a claim, the furlough portal became available on the 20th of April for the first time. And as an employer, you should make a claim in accordance with the actual payroll amounts at the point at which payroll is run or in advance of any imminent payroll. And employers must pay the employee, employee all the grant they receive for their gross fee, fee. No fees can be charged or taken from the money that has been granted. This same principle will apply when applying for flexible furlough wages. Now, change this week where holidays and furlough is concerned. So annual leave can be taken at the same time as furlough, but the employer must top up payment for holidays to 100%. This is for employees on furlough, not flexible furlough. If employees usually take bank holidays as a holiday, then employers will either have to top up to 100% or give a day off in lieu if they're and back 80% on the scheme. Now employees can have a rule that there's no annual leave to be taken during furlough and the 
Government bought in that it's now possible to carry four weeks over of leave to the next two holiday years, if not reasonably practicable to take due to the coronavirus. Now I'm going to stress those words reasonably practicable because I've had a lot of calls for employers who have had their employees saying to them, I can carry this over and I'm going to. Well, again, it comes back to the words of reasonably practicable to suit your business. I would also refer you back to your policies and procedures where annual leave is concerned as well. Annual employees can request leave while on furlough, and this can be refused as normal. And I know as soon as the holiday channels are opening up, and this is changing from day to day, there's going to be a deluge of annual leave requests. So again, it's your policies and procedures that really support the decisions you make. If employees are flexibly furloughed, any hours taken as holiday during the claim period should be counted in recording as furloughed hours rather than working hours. But this is something that's just changed. This means employers can include those hours in their claim to the scheme. So to summarise, furloughed staff will be able to return to work part-time from the 1st of July. Employers will need to pay in full for the time they work and the rest of the time will still be funded by the government up to a cap. And government contributions to the scheme are going to change from the 1st of August. Now we've had a lot of calls on how to calculate furlough, how to claim it, what, what information you should put into the portal. We have Bright HR which is online HR system and an online furlough navigator and it's also included the on online flexible furlough navigator for keeping accurate records for the information you need to apply to the scheme and also all the documentation you need for agreeing for moving forward. I'm just going to let it run to show how it can assist you as a business. Introducing Bright HR's Back to Work Navigator. The Back to Work Navigator is easily accessible from your Bright HR dashboard and will guide you through all of your return to work processing. You will see the number of currently furloughed employees within the business and a quick link to create back to work rotors, ensuring that the safety and well-being of your staff is accounted for as members of the team return. Rotors will also alert you to current employee absence as you add shifts, ensuring that the correct individuals are assigned to the correct working times. Once a rotor is published, everyone included in that rotor will receive a notification informing them that a new rotor has been added and that they're included. This will be sent directly to their Bright HR account via email and if they have the Bright HR app downloaded on their mobile, to their mobile phone too. In order to track and monitor these staggered shifts, you also have access to our free Clocking In and Clocking Out app, Blip. Blip will allow you to oversee the working times for your employees and add any instances of lateness to their profile should start times not be adhered to. You will also be able to view all current and past furlough absences in the calendar, giving you at a glance information pertaining to the start and end times or ongoing furlough absences within the business. The Back to Work Navigator will also allow you to create company-wide notifications which will be sent to every member of staff on the system, providing you the quick and simple means to convey important messages and information to your employees. As part of Bright HR's Back to Work tools, we have also created a Back to Work e-learning course with information and guidance on various aspects of return, such as social distancing and hygiene measures within the business providing a certificate upon completion of the final assessment. Our new employee status feature will allow you to view and edit the location of an employee if they are away from the company site, assisting with the preparation of social distancing measures within the workplace. The annual leave summary report will further support this, allowing you to track annual leave taken and the remaining balance for individual employees within this annual leave year. You also have access to our 24 hour advice line, connecting you to a member of the team who can provide expert advice on all things required in the return to work process. Finally, as part of our back to work navigator, you will also find all of the support, guidance and advice required to ensure that you are both compliant and safe when staff members return. Resources here include downloadable templates, which can be utilized and adapted 
to suit all of your business needs. Log in to Bright HR today to guarantee that you are back to work ready and fully compliant with return to work procedures. So as you can see, it's very much takes you through, makes sure you log the right information and it's very clear the communication to your staff, two-way communication as well, because there's been a lot of changes going on since the pandemic. It's, it's turned businesses upside down, inside out, including employees, but communicating effectively so there's good compliance and clear understanding and ownership both ways of what's required moving forward is so key. So we make sure legislation works for you, the employer. Again, as I mentioned, the decisions you make, the discussions you have, the document you have, you're getting it right first time. I hope this webinar has been of assistance to you. As I said, unfortunately, Nick is not able to get in. If you do have any questions or you would like to see the Bright HR demo to you remotely or face-to-face, -face, whatever suits you, do email nick at nick.babbington at krona.co.uk. And obviously, if you want to know any more about the service and what policies and procedures you should have updated because of the changes to the way we work now, Nick will be more than happy to chat you through that as well as he's very local into your area and he's also a BBF member. So I would like to say thank you very much. I'm going to unshare my screen now and come back into the room. Thank you, Jill. Welcome. That was great. Um, do we have any questions? Please feel free to unmute uh, and and post a question, Teresa. Yes, please. I've got two actually. Okay. Um, right at the beginning, we talked about um, agreements with staff going on to flexible working. Yes. Um, I've emailed all of the staff and shared via email. Do I need to follow that up with a written letter? Do I need to ensure that every single member of staff has emailed me back? to acknowledge that they have understood what I've said through our email. So this is on full furlough? This, no, this is on the flexible furlough. So you've emailed them now saying they're going on to flexible work. I would be asking them to email back saying they agree, understand, and are happy to be flexibly furloughed. Okay, okay. Um, okay it's, it's a change to the working conditions. Okay, okay, I, I, I can do that. Yes. Um, sorry, and my other question then, can you clarify holiday? Because one of the things that I've done through fixed furlough is where staff have been on fixed furlough, we have up um, their pay, we've, we've sort of given them the 100% with a day's holiday per week um, to manage our sort of holiday as well going through. So hopefully that we'll have, um, we'll have staff in when, we, when work increases. Um, there's, there's, I'm going to separate those two out if you don't mind. Yeah. So if you were paying 80% of pay to staff, which is absolutely fine, it was up to you if you wanted to up into 100%. So in the contract terms, if for example, the 28 days per annum were to include all bank holidays, you had the two bank holidays in May, for those two days, you should have paid them the extra 20%, which it sounds like you did. So that's fine. Now, where holiday is concerned, you can ask staff to take holiday when they're furloughed, but you must give them double the amount of notice to the time they want to take. So if you want them to take a day, you have to give them two days notice. Okay. Okay. Um, so that, that's fine. So from the second part for the furlough, so from yesterday, uh, Wednesday. For furlough. Yeah, explain that because it sounded like you were saying that we could claim that, that holiday back as furlough. Yeah, as the 80%. Oh, as the 80%, yeah. So not, yeah. But So if I wanted to continue um, paying staff 100%, then um, they would either have to agree to take a day's holiday or we just take that hit on the 20%. It's, it's very much to, to do with audit trails and they agree because whilst it's swimming along nicely at the moment, you, you know your staff better than I do, we've got some fabulous staff. Yeah. We've got some staff that like to press our buttons, like to be a bit difficult, tell you they know what their rights are, you, you know the ones I'm talking about. And you know, for some people, they see any anything that's not as it should be, they'll make a claim. Sadly, that's the world we're li living in. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the tribunals are looking at whether to reintroduce fees again later on, but that's a fight with the unions as well. But putting that aside, 
we've already started to see a rise in claims being put in because we get to see the numbers obviously of, of okay. claims being made and a CAS conciliation first of all because as, as I said very early on the decisions employers make and I so understand this understand why they're doing it it's morally right procedurally wrong it's all to do with procedures mm -hmm. so if you later on have a difficult employee who said well actually they said I had to do this I had to do that I had no choice and you've got emails back saying yes I understand I agree your audit trail is such to say well and it stops it in its tracks as long as it's done accurately which is why we also help companies with bespoke contracts policies procedures mm -hmm. in line with what you need from your staff within your business and the other legislation and we guide you through so any issues we give you the templates and everything you need and then obviously with the indemnity we can represent you in tribunal should you get a claim and so you have the full protection and peace of mind. Um, but, you know, the, the landscape's changing. It is all going to do with what you've embedded in this, how you've done it. And, but it sounds like you're trotting along quite nicely. Yeah, just quite like to have some work and get them all back in, really. <laughs> well, in an ideal world, that would be so wonderful. You know. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Jill, um, I've had a, an email through the chat um, from Rachel saying, would you use Blip for furlough hours to record when they work? Uh, first of all, Rachel, do you have the Bright Headcast system with Blip? Because it can go to the smartphones. So that's how you'd recording and you would take that information forward. If you haven't got it, you'd like more information on the Blip HR, Bright HR system, then do make contact with Nick or through Maxine that uh, Maxine can then pass that referral forward and he can show you exactly how that works. You have it already. Okay. So if you go through to the advice line, bring the advice line and they will take you through that step by step. You're very welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, can I ask you? Yes. Is it possible to ask a couple of questions? Um, so on the ACAS letters, when you're doing the template, it says for those you're bringing back on flexible book furlough, you have to give them specific hours per week. How does that work for bank staff? Okay. So you've mentioned ACAS templates. We have our own templates that work for you. So I'm going to set that to one side. If you've got bank, bank is very different anyway, because at bank are only paid for the hours they work. Yeah. Okay, so you, the, the agreement you have with the bank staff is very different to employees for flexible furlough. But all my, all my casual staff are counted as employees and they've all been on, flex, on furlough. And okay. so they're now coming back off furlough. But when I did the flexible furlough letters, it asked for specific um, hours per week. And that's really difficult when you bring them in and out as you need to. I agree. And that's why with flexible furlough, they're saying you must have the accurate records. Now, if you're in a business and I'm not going to ask your business, but I'm going to give you an example. Now, so you have a business and you think you're going to be really busy one day. You want them in the seven hours and then there's nothing to do. You want to be able to send them home, don't you? Yeah, so, it's, it's not really like that it works. It's more like um, it's more like changing each week. So yeah, we have to change the letter every week. To May I respectfully suggest a CAS is a generic view. Okay. It doesn't take each individual business circumstance one by okay. one. Okay. If it's something you would like to chat about further, then do make contact with Nick and he'll happily take you through what can work maybe more effectively for you possibly. Okay, thanks. And um, can I ask also for casual contracts, when you're checking the average hours in the corresponding calendar year, do you include holiday hours? No, because they don't have holiday hours. They just get the extra pay, don't they, for the hours they've accrued yeah. each month. Yeah. So it's on the yeah. hours they've worked. So you're talking about, for example, zero-hour contracts? Yeah. Okay. So zero-hour contracts, you will take the, um, when they did the most hours, but the holiday is paid as a cash sum, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. So it, you don't have to include that in the hours for the furlough? because they don't qualify for holiday pay. They do qualify for holiday pay. They don't qualify for the physical hours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it will be for the, the most hours they've worked it for the corresponding time. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah. Has anyone else got any more questions? Rob, I, I see you unmuted. I didn't know if you had a question. No, the question was actually covered by uh, one of the previous questions, actually, which was actually just in terms of the documentation you need to give to, to give to your employees who you're putting on flexible furlough. So important. 
Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, 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 Mark Houghton here. I, I, I have a question. Yes. Um, regarding the holiday and the 100% pay, um, yeah. if, uh, as our company has, we've chosen to pay uh, it was to top up the furlough wage but not back up to the 100%, so it was somewhere mm -hmm. in between. So they're still winning, yeah. Uh, yeah, so they're still better off. Um, can we, when we give them holiday, can we take that as an accumulative amount? So in other words, on average, they will have been paid for those holidays at 100%, or would you have to specifically pay them for the holiday days at 100% of their... It's specifically the holiday days. So you couldn't say, well, okay, well, we paid you 90% for all of the days. No, because it would be a British contract. Right. Because where holidays, can, it was your, yes, this is where you, you can't do right for wrong. So you generously agreed to pay more than the 80% which you can claim. But right. where holiday, that, that was your choice. And this is the way this will be looked at. Um, so it was your choice. But where you, the holiday days are concerned, those days must be 100%. Because okay. you may think that's reasonable they may think it's reasonable at the time but what you don't need is somebody in their family saying hang on a minute it should be 80 percent those days that's breach of contract and it will be okay uh, and i did have one other question sorry uh the the business we're in is um which was sort of covered in, on your presentation but um on the hours we 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 work a fixed amount of days but not necessarily a fixed amount of hours so our our, our crew are on site so they may have a travel day uh to site which may only be three hours they're not paid for three hours they're paid for the whole day but the next day they might work you know, a long a very long day so it's very hard to work out what their actual hours were last year because we've only got the records of days work so how would you think we would incorporate that in a flexible furlough agreement mark we'll need to have you'll need to have a chat with that off with nick off yeah. side the reason for that is it all comes back to your contract terms yeah okay right. okay and what things have been made and whether it's been agreed and things like that. Yeah. Okay. That, that's one that's just not easy enough to answer. No, no, I didn't think it would be. I think yeah, but we'll happily talk to you through talk you through it. Yeah. It's not okay. a problem. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Um, has anyone else got any more questions? Anything around the bright bright HR portal or all right, Teresa, can you unmute yourself? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot That's to unmute right. myself. Um, I just thought I'd share with everyone. I've had a call from HMRC, so they are sort of following up, and they wanted to clarify something because I'd, I'd, I had made a mistake, um, and really it was. Um, I think there was a, a a lack of understanding when the furlough scheme um, portal was um, was developed. In that, as a company, we have weekly paid staff and we have monthly paid staff. So that one week a month when we were paying monthly staff and weekly staff, we had a spikes for those two months in our claims, but also you can't retrospectively, so when I put the claim in for that week, you can't, for those certain members of staff that are monthly paid, you can't retrospectively do it from the beginning of the month to the end of the month, because I'd already claimed for the weekly paid staff. So just just to be aware, there are phone calls. So uh, I, very, I did panic. I was like, oh. They are being they, very proactive and so are health and safety. Yeah. Hot checks for COVID-19 yeah. secure. So yes, a bit nerve wracking, but you know. You survived. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Thanks for sharing that.